Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to show my research here at the Staffan Memorial. Unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to meet him personally, but I always admire his work and, and this meeting is the proof that he was a wonderful scientist, a person. My name is Ainar Sistiaga and I'm a research scientist in MIT in human evolution. And my past work has been focused on developing new uh, analytical tools to better understand the role of diet in human evolution. And today I'm gonna go briefly through the main dietary shifts in human evolution and then highlighting a, a little bit uh, some of my previous and current work. So how we did become human? This is one of the most persistent questions in our society. At present, it seems that some light has been shed on when and where, but the, how we diverge from our ape ancestors is still a shrouding mystery. And what was the role on diet on this diversion? Uh, increased meat of, uh, increased as consumption of meat seems to be uh, one of the uh, main uh, factors that trigger our human evolution. From an archaeological point of view, uh, what we really know about our ancestors' diet? What are the main sources of information? So we archaeologists will usually have uh, a few uh, ways to know uh, the diet for ancestors and um, the main source of information are the reconstructed biomechanics of hominin jaws and teeth, a stable acid of analysis of bone and teeth, hominin occlusal microware and archaeological, so archaeological and taphonomic evidence. But the problem is that none of this method has been capable of bringing to light the proportions of plant and meat intake in our ancestors' diet. So now I'm going to go briefly through uh, what are the evidence for carnivory in pre-homo species and then carnivory in homo species. So major progress has been made in hominid paleontology reconstructions through incorporation of a stable carbon isotope analysis in fossil bones. However, a stable, a stable carbon isotope analysis cannot distinguish between herbivore, carnivore and omnivore diets. On one hand, our current view of Australopithecus diet is based mainly in bone chemistry, which suggests that most of Australopithecus had a plant-based diet that ranged from C3 to C4 plants and some of them with a mixture of both. In light of this, the picture of first hominins diet is largely dominated by plants, seeds and fruit like our close relative chimpanzees. And on the other hand, the craniofacial structure of some of these hominins uh, is suggesting that they were, had an omnivore diet. The thing is that if panins hunt and eat small sized mammals without technology, then it's reasonable to infer that hunting, the predatory hunting behavior of prelytic hominins did not differ too much from our uh, relative uh, uh, chimpanzee's behavior. When uh, there is uh, increasing evidence that from around 2.5 million years ago, there is a dietary shift towards increased dietary breadth from Australopithecus to uh, Homo. This has been documented in morphological traits and with Homo, there is also more numerous archaeological sites with evidence of animal processing. Archaeological evidence show that by 1.8, Homo erectus was having access, primary access to carcasses of large ungulates and other small prey through scavenging and mostly by hunting. In fact, Homo erectus is viewed as the first hominin with a significantly large brain, and this has been linked to increased dietary breadth. How we sustain this uh, uh, trend of encephalization? So as Ian Tattersall said, no matter how desirable an evolutionary innovation might in theory be, there is no way in which it can be expressed if the potential for acquiring it is not already there. So we need a necessary substrate in order to make of brains larger. Animal tissue intake greatly increased access to perform omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, which constitute 90% of the uh, fatty acids on the gray matter. The intake of these fatty acids, also known as brain building blocks, are essential for brain and retinal de development, as well as for reproduction. So they must have been a prerequisite for encephalization. Access to this performing long chain omega-3 and omega-6 is exclusive to meat eaters, so you can get some 
uh, these omega-3 and omega-6 from uh, some plant uh, uh, fatty acids, so it's insufficient to sustain this disproportion disproportionately uh, large human brain. Here in this slide, we can see one of the most important fatty acids, DHA, from brain, brain de development. The richest dietary source of these omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids available for early hominids was probably a branch of large uh, ungulates or ruminants that probably through scavenging they were acquiring it part of this uh, brain and bone marrow that together satisfied uh, uh, increased dietary quality and omega-3 to sustain this uh, brain uh, development. Mm -hmm. Access to, uh, interestingly, the fish at some point also probably became one of the source of omega-3 and omega-6 like uh, is shown by the evidence in Turkana Basan sites, but in our, there is not too much uh, evidence that is supporting uh, this as a, a staple diet in early hominin diets. So now I would like to show you a different approach from an ecological point of view to how to understand uh, what early hominins were eating in at least in Old Dubai Gorge that, as uh, some of you know, is one of the main uh, archaeological sites or main hot points to understand early human behavior. Uh, it is impossible to assess the importance of these uh, aquatic and terrestrial food sources in early hominin diets. We don't really understand uh, a local landscape condition uh, of early human sites in a time scale sufficiently accurate to, to enable us to correlate this data with uh, hominin behavior. So the stratigraphy of all the white gorge is la largely influenced by periods of regression and uh, extension of the lake. And as you can see here, there is a layer that is called Sinch because it's where the Sijanthropus was found by the leakage in 1959. And it's a paleo that is sealed by two tufts, so it's completely well preserved and is composed of clay and it's actually composed of three, four small sub-layers that has been studied as a, as a single layer archaeologically and geochemically uh, in the past. So since the leakage discovered the Cichanthropus, numerous uh, fossil remains have been found in Old Dubai Gorge, mostly from Homo habilis and Cichanthropus or Paranthropus boise. But last year our team discovered in DS, the site I will tell you, I will tell you about later, uh, a new fossil from a pinky bone that is suggesting that uh, there is a homo, modern homo looking uh, a bit, uh, that is occupying this site too. So these three species, the Janthropus, uh, Paranthropus we say, I mean um, Homo habilis or Homo erectus, it might be at the origin of the depo archaeological deposit of the Sinch layer. Here also on the right you can see a reconstruction of the topography of the Sinch layer. You can see that we have the volcanoes around and there is some water streams. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this later. So what we have done actually, or our idea was to analyze the lipids from the uh, sediments on the sinch layer at the DS site. This newly discovered site was discovered two years ago. We have been digging the, there for two years and we have excavated already 480 square meters and, um, and recovered more than 5,000 archaeological remains and some uh, hominin fossils too, and today represent the biggest window to understand early human behavior. Uh, we collected samples, sediment samples, samples from the archaeological profiles. As you can see here, we can easily see four different layers. And then we collected also uh, sediment samples uh, from the surface, archaeological surface near the butchering areas. So one of the analyses uh, we have done is the analysis of lead waxes. So lead waxes are lipids are in the in in the cut, in the cuticles of the of the plants of the leaves. So they are really good markers to understand past vegetation. Also, if we apply some ratios, we can better understand what is the uh, proportion of aquatic versus uh, terrestrial input to soils, and that can help us to actually assess what is the importance of the water on the areas where hominins were uh, developing their activities. So we analyzed these hydrocarbons 
in, in the different four layers of this side and apply this ratio that is called the PAQ. And if you look at the top layer, we can see that we, can, uh, we have some terrestrial patches in brown uh, surrounded by some, uh, some um, water uh, areas that are uh, uh, presenting aquatic macrophytes, emerging macrophytes, that means that it's only a little bit of water, there's not deep water around. And we can see that some of these terrestrial patches often matches the areas where more remains are. If we look at the next uh, layer that we call, lim we call limo, we can see that uh, there is less uh, terrestrial patches that are surrounded by aquatic macrophytes that means water. When looking at the 22B, which is the richest layer, archaeological layer, on all the Gorge where the Cyanthropus and all these fossils have been found, uh, we can see that there is an increasing amount of terrestrial patches surrounded by some water. And as you, here in the image, you can see in red, these are bone remains, while in blue, we have lithic technology. Interestingly, uh, when we look at the distribution of the archaeological remains, we can see that uh, these um, terrestrial patches often match the areas where there is more remains. Finally, when we look at the last layer that is mostly sterile in the, in from an archaeological point of view, we can see that it is clearly dominated by aquatic macrophytes, so mostly the site was uh, flowed by water. We have applied other proxies like the uh, isotopic, carbon isotopic uh, analysis of these specific compounds and we're looking at the 32, 31 uh, carbon uh, enalkane or flea waxes. The, the values obtained, they are not clearly diagnostic of a, three, of a C3 or C4 landscape. Which, uh, what it can be uh, showing us that actually something in between that might be because of this uh, regression and periods of variability, wet, dry, but also it can be pointed to the presence of some plants that actually have an intermediate metabolism or CAM metabolism. This could be supported actually by the presence of uh, these uh, 23 alkanon that we have here in the bottom, or uh, also this docoxenoid acid uh, that is a uh, uh, omega-9 uh, hydroxy acid that also is pointing us to algae and water in the area. Uh, what is interesting that I think these biomarkers are pointing us to a, a, domin a variable landscape that is actually dominated by a wetland um, with uh, mosses, ferns and sedges. And this uh, landscape or this picture actually is not uh, compatible with the arid parian landscape and salinity of the lake that some models have used previously. The macrobotanical fossils also comes to support this idea. Uh, here you, we can see that uh, there is like uh, typha roots that are uh, showing that there is C3 graminoids like typha that were abundant in this DS uh, singe layer. Also we have silicide combs in singe sediments that resemble the edible USOs of African cryptograms that also uses a intermediate metabolism like some ferns. Here we have, have also some uh, remains of mole rats that also point to the presence of underground, underground storage organs. The presence of ed these edible plants near the sites together with fresh water might be, have been a determining factor on the way hominins occupy the space. We also recover a significant amount of phytolites, which are fossils, uh, silica fossils that are uh, diagnostic for plants through the singe sequence. These results show that the distribution of phytolis on the map, uh, the different size, we can see that uh, most of the size there is a significant presence of ferns, including in the S, and they are dominated by forest plants with some contributions, plant, palm trees and ferns. It's interesting that we have not found in any of our samples uh, the presence of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are actually markers of fire. So that points us to the next dietary shift, the cooking revolution. As most of you know, Rang Richard Rankin uh, and colleagues have suggested that the fire has an essential role in our evolution by easing the access to essential nutrients in food 
that in food that was probably too hard to digest or chew without cooking. However, it's likely that our ancestors started eating meat long before they start cooking. There is evidence for that our early ancestors were regularly eating meat as far back as 2.5 million years, but cooking doesn't seem to become common at least 500 years ago. The oldest incontrovertible evidence for a human controlled fire that's to 800,000 years ago, but it's only with Neanderthals that we start seeing a staple use of fire, controlled use of fire. Regardless of when cooking originated, this technology likely represents a major dietary shift because it increased the digestibility of both meat and plant foods. So with Neanderthals, we start seeing this kind of stratigraphy that is, is completely plenty of uh, fires, one another after another, and there are usually, um, we can see that is a, a control use of fire. So to wrap up a little bit, uh, understanding the timing of when the first member of our lineage started to incorporate animal tissues in their diet on a regular basis is what's crucial to the fate of our species. But this is not likely to have happened unless the ancestor of Homo, as primates were not previously omnivores and consumed meat occasionally. In light of this, most of the debate has focused on how much meat was necessary to influence our, our biology and how we acquired it. So far we have conveyed a picture of the evolution of human diet where hominins first, like, first have an ape-like diet uh, focused in, 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 plant, in plants with uh, they evolve by incorporating an increasing amount of animal tissues. And well, just after that, we, the polyurethane reconstructions jump to the next pictures with our the Neanderthals, the most widely studied hominin in the fossil record. The Neanderthals are portrayed as top predators that subsisted merely on large game meat, as much as carnivores. But what are the evidence for this scenario? So our, actually, what we have right now, we have uh, Currently, there is a lack of direct evidence of plant ingestion, and we do not know the proportion of animal or plant tissue intake in Neanderthal diets. The ubiquitous occurrence of fine faunal assemblages and lithic technology in Neanderthal sites and the overly scanty uh, preservation of plant remains have given rise to a picture of Neanderthals as a population that subsists on hunting regardless of the climatic conditions. Evidence supporting this view came from the incorporation of carbon and uh, nitrogen stable isotopes to bone to predatory research. Most of these studies conclude that Neanderthals were top level predators at the top of the food chain as lions or hyenas. Despite several attempts, it appears that collagen is not well preserved in warm areas, so the isotopic record comes from cold high latitudes. So the image conveyed of Neanderthals is a top predator, subsisting solely on large-sized herbivore meat. Here I would like to point out that independently of this regional bias in the evidence, perhaps the Neanderthal diet should be approached on a regional basis anyways. The scientific discourse speaks of the Neanderthal diet as an entity, but Neanderthals were a population with a very broad uh, geographical range that included many different ecosystems. It seems unlikely that Neanderthals in Northern Europe had the same diet as those living in the Near East. Therefore, in our work, we take a regional approach to the study of Neanderthal diet. Now, recent evidence have uh, changed the view of Neanderthals are what 100% meat consumers. Analysis of dental calcul calculus and micro remains trapped in Neanderthal teeth uh, shows that they were exploring a broad range of, of plants and supporting evidence comes from the recovery of plant remains such as, such as pistachios or legumes in Middle Eastern sites. We believe that as omnivores, the nutritional goal in order to warranty survival and reproduction of the species is to have a balanced intake of essential macronutrients rather than to focus on the acquisition of specific food sources. Carnivory, carnivory sorry, in Neanderthals would probably not achieve an adequate uh, macronutrient balance, and yet this spe species thrived in Europe for more than 200,000 years. So we think that the role of plants in the Neanderthal diet has been un underestimated due to the met methodological uh, bias related to the preferential preservation of bones over plants. This is one of the things that have motivated my research 
to find new sources of information to bring to light the revival of plants in Neanderthal diets. So maybe uh, the answer to this lack of methodological method, uh, approaches is in their feces, actually. What if we could, if we could extract information about plant and animal tissues ingesting Neanderthal from fecal matter? As I showed you before, lipids are supposed that to DNA and proteins, they are pre-recalcitrant, so they are very stable and can survive for millions of years. This is why they are wonderful uh, biomarkers. So the method I have applied is the lipid bi fecal biomarkers, and uh, these five beta esthanols are metabolic products of the reduction of cholesterol and plant esterols by gut bacteria. They are uniquely formed by gut bacteria. So the same esterol from plants and animal tissues when degraded by the environment, microbes, they produce exactly the same molecule but with an alpha position of the hydrogen bond. So that means that the coprostanol 5 beta external, the 5 beta stanols, they are actually uniquely formed by the gut bacteria. So they become uh, perfect candidates to understand the digestion of plants versus animal tissues. So here I'm going to show you uh, just a brief summary of the work I published in 2014 in PLOS ONE. And we analyzed uh, lipids from sediments in this uh, Neanderthal site in Alicante in Spain, a site that has been dated on 50,000 years uh, ago. And we analyzed uh, different uh, sediment samples from different occupation flows by showing you here five that comes from different fires that were found in this site. And in red, you can see the coprostanol uh, and epicoprostanol uh, molecules that are actually, or proportions, that are actually the ones that are mark uh, markers of uh, meat intake. Uh, and in green, you can see the markers of plant ingestion. So as you can see here, we have only, most of the samples have a predominant coprostanol and epicoprostanol that will point to a meat-based diet. But in some of the samples, we have some significant, significant amount of plant ingestion markers. Here in the, in the, in the left, you can see uh, a thin section picture that we found some microcoprolites with the presence of nematodes and, and eggs and nematodes from parasites that in this case were attributed to ascaris. So a closer look to one of our samples, we can see that while coprostanol is the main 5 beta esthanol, there is a significant proportion of a plant marker. It might seem small, but when compare the amount of esterol present in a uh, gram per gram in a steak and a spinach, we can understand that this probably represents a significant intake of plants. When we compare the lipid excretion of Neanderthal with our closest white primates, uh, chimpanzees and and gorillas, in this case they are wild from Uganda, we can see that they are clearly uh, grouped se separately, indicating that their diets are quite different. So I'm not going to spend too much time explaining these uh, graphics here for non human primates. So just to let you know that and analyzing the feces from gorillas and chimpanzees, we saw that uh, gorillas had an increased. Um, uh, cholesterol met metabolism, an enhanced cholesterol metabolism, and that uh, a compensatory behavior in the production of biosynthesis of cholesterol. And they were, uh, these enhanced cholesterol metabolism can also be associated to the unusual sensitivity to cholesterol in chimpanzees and gorillas, that are fivefold more sensitive to dietary cholesterol than humans and other world monkeys. This greater susceptibility will also explain the high rate of hypercholesterolemia in captive chimpanzees and gorillas. So if this trait was shared with our early ancestors, how we became biologically capable of supporting such a large, largely carnivorous diet? So I think part of the answer might be in our microbiome. The bacteria responsible of the conversion of cholesterol to coprostanol is very different in humans and in animals. So we humans have these bacteroides a species strain DA that use a different metabolism to convert cholesterol to coprostanol, while most of young animals that uh, produce coprostanol uh, from cholesterol, they use these eubacterium coprostanol agents. When we look at the phylogeny of these two bacterial uh, species, we see that the human one is actually well um, 
uh, assigned to the phylogeny of the bacteroides, while the phy phylogeny of the bacterium corpostan layer actually is related to the costridia. And they have very different evolutionary history and they are very separately one from another. So maybe using lipids, we can use lipids to reveal the enzyme microbiome. And this is something that I have been working lately. And we, can, we know that the metabolism of bacteria produces specific li lipids that can be traced in the feces. So this opened a new window to the study of ancestral microbiomes. Despite increasing evidence that the microbiome ha has an important role in essential core uh, function of our biology, letting us know how we co-evolve with our microbial partners. The role of microbiome in human evolution has been overlooked uh, historically, mainly because we lack the methods to uh, know, get information from microbiome in the past. So I think it's uh, essential to, in order to better understand the role of microbial partners in human evolution is necessary to develop tools to investigate gut bacteria in the fossil record and generate a reference database that includes different diets and lifestyles. For this reason, we have recently created the Global Microbiome Conservancy, which is a joint initiative between MIT, the Center for Microbiome Informatics and Therapeutics, and the Broad Institute. And our intention is to collect more than 1,000 individual donors uh, sal saliva, uh, urine and feces for uh, donors are in more than 30 countries around the world, six continents, and we will culture these bacteria and save them in a, in a bacterial bank. And we will analyze the genomes and metabolomics. And the interesting thing is that we are going to also analyze the lipids. So we will generate a, a database that will allow us to look at the fossil record after and get more information about the uh, ancestral microbiomes. So the take home messages actually is, is really, I think uh, is kind of common sense, but paleoetary reconstructions are often quite simplistic. We don't know too much about politic diets. It's necessary to address the study of ancestral diets from a holistic approach, taking into account the local conditions. It doesn't seem to be a particular ecosystem that triggers the human evolution. On the contrary, most hominins thrive in different ecosystems successfully adapting to the variable conditions. Our preliminary results on Neanderthals can be considered the first direct evidence of omnivory, but they are also pointed to a broader dietary spectrum. This can also, the problem with this also is that it can be also a single meal, so we can gen not generalize on uh, what the Neanderthal diet was. As I say, there is not a Neanderthal diet, actually, as there is not a Paleolithic diet. Neanderthals occupy a broad geographical range and, and chronology, and it seems unlikely that they were in the same in the north um, in Belgium that in Gibraltar. Lipid analysis is a useful tool in the study of ancestral diets and microbiome, and I think so, also something very important, it is essential to calibrate models with fossil reference from archaeology, geology, etc. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions in the roundtable. Thank you.